Well, good morning. It's good to have you here, and we look forward to hearing from the Word of God this morning as we gather together. We're going to be in Colossians chapter 3, Colossians chapter 3, and verses 17 through chapter 4 and verse 1. We're talking today about relationships that will glorify God, relationships that will glorify God. Now, you might be worried, I will tell you in advance, you don't need to be because quite frankly, there's enough material here and there are enough, certainly enough topics here to um, be able to take care of an entire conference. Many different specific relationships listed. Our purpose today, I will tell you in advance, is not to go into minute detail on every relationship listed but rather to put it into the greater context of this passage to see how this fits in with this concept of focusing on bringing glory to God and that that is true in our everyday relationships as well. Now, perhaps you have heard, I'm guessing most of you have not, have heard of an individual by the name of Amu Haji, uh, I had never heard of him. Uh, he only came into my knowledge as I was looking at some news feeds recently. He recently passed away. He was elderly. Um, I don't know exactly how old. But he, uh, in a, or right adjacent to a uh, community in Iran by the name of Dejag, Dejag, Iran, was somehow... Uh, decided that he was the world's dirtiest man. The world's dirtiest man. Now, in order to attain this great pinnacle of, of uh, popularity, and what I don't know that he was popular. In fact, I think probably quite the opposite. He had not had a bath for over six decades. He had gone over 60 years without a bath the world's dirtiest man somehow he he managed to get that that uh a tag added to him he was noted for his filthiness he was noted for his laziness he was noted for his not so pleasant diet and uh, i've been warned in advance we will not go into details about that uh at one point people did feel some pity for him and they put together some cinder blocks and a little tin roof and gave him a place where he wasn't at least outside all the time. I saw some pictures in his later life and he lived up to his moniker, the world's dirtiest man. I would say, and by the way, I probably don't have to say this, but to my grandkids who are here today, it is not a life goal to go 60 years without a bath, <laughs> all right? You should take them regularly. Uh, now, interestingly enough, in the world in which we live, somebody always has to have the tag. So the story that I read already had identified a new individual, this one living somewhere in India, who is currently now noted as the world's dirtiest living man. So I have no idea how this comes about. But here's the point. Is that what you want to be noted for? Is that what you wanted to want to be remembered for? As people look at you in your life, do you want to be noted in a way like that? So this series of messages all has to do with how the glory of the Lord should be on focus even in every element, every part of our lives. And so as people look at us, what is it that they think of? Well, we had the reading that Scott shared with us earlier from James chapter 2. This deals with a number of topics. Uh, one of the critical ones in that passage has to do with partiality, which is a difficult thing in our world. It's a very common thing. But we have to be careful of that. We have to understand that God looks at all of us as sinners who are in need of his grace and we need to show 
just a wonderful openness and readiness to share and help and demonstrate that love toward others around us. But the interesting thing in that passage is that in chapter 2, verse 1 of James, it begins by referring to our Lord Jesus Christ as the Lord of glory. So it's not that it's just Jesus. I, I don't think you can ever use just the word just or only with Jesus because there's so much involved there. But he is the Lord of glory. He is the one to whom glory should be given. And then in chapter 2, verse 7, it reminds us that if we behave dishonorably, we are blaspheming the honorable name by which you are called. Think about that. He is the Lord of glory. We owe him glory. It is his honorable name. We owe him that honor, even in the way that we refer to others. And hopefully, there we go. Uh, let me just wave at me if this thing falls, because if every once in a while it feels like the mic is going somewhere else. Uh, but in any case, the dealing with the treatment of others, James makes it very plain that this has to do with bringing glory and honor to our God, to our Lord. A very common verse, a very popular verse in Matthew 5, verse 16 says, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify, glorify your Father which is in heaven. Again, our lives ought to be pointing to glorify our Father which is in heaven. Now, there's a simple three-step part to that verse because if people are going to see us, what does that imply? Well, that somehow we're around people, right? So we are around people, number one. Number two, what is it that we have, according to Matthew 5, 16? Well, we have good works. And why is it that that is important? That they may glorify your Father, which is in heaven. So what do people notice about us? What kind of good works? Well, there are many, or else this would be a one-week sermon series. There are many ways in which we glorify God, right? But there is a very prominent one that we look at today, and that is how we relate to other people. How we relate to other people. How do people see our good works? We want them to see our good works, to interact with us and glorify our Father which is in heaven. How does that happen? How does that happen on the job? How do they see our good works? Likely by the way we offer ourselves in diligence and faithfulness and service. How is it that they see that, those good works? We'll, we'll go above and beyond. What about even in charities, in donations and things like that? How is it that they see the charitable part of our lives and glorify God? Well, Probably not if they see that we're willing to give and donate for our own attention, for our own glory, for our own uh, benefit. Uh, there are some, uh, many in the business world, that would even talk about giving uh, a certain charitable donation or an ongoing uh, benefit in some way to a community for the sake of advertising their business. And so we understand that even in the charitableness, what about our neighborhoods? Do they see us? Do they wonder? I had an interesting observation or a discussion with uh, managers at our uh, recently uh, at the apartments where we live. And uh, I, I, I even said to them, you know, because I knew there had been this and that going on and a few issues once in a while and things raised. And I said, well, listen, I said, uh, you know, Please just have the openness to t come and talk to us. Let us know if there's anything that we're doing that's causing issues, causing problems. And the response was, they said, oh, no, please don't leave. We want you, people like you to stay. That's not about me. That's about all of us as believers, that we can be the kind, even as Michelle was saying this morning in our discipleship time, the kind that would unscheduled, take time to help somebody else that's living in the neighborhood, in the apartments, with a need that was there. We can demonstrate Christ in that way as well. What about our families? 
what kind of good works do we perform in our families that others would see those and glorify God, our Father which is in heaven? Are our families perfect? Well, no, no. Hopefully, we are aiming that way and seeking that way to, to God's glory, but there ought to be a genuine respect and love and kindness and that kind of thing demonstrating that others would see us and realize, you know, there's something different about that individual. And so the key note, the key thought this morning is simply this, that we need to relate to others while focusing on God for the purpose of his glory. Now, there are three points. Uh, you may have been concerned that there were going to be many after you looked at the passage, uh, but there are three that we will look at today. The first doesn't even really quite get to our text, and it is the most important because, as I say, we're looking at the principles here by which we can use and develop our, our relationships in a way that will hopefully bring glory to God and attention to Him in that way. The first is that we look at the first part of the book of Colossians as we get toward our text, and we're reminded of our focus. What is our focus in our relationships? What is that? Now, let me go to the text and let you know what I mean by that. Chapter 3, verse 17, the first verse of the text. Whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. So, what is going to follow is in, under this umbrella that we need to do this for the Lord and toward the Lord. Look down in verse 23. Whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men. Again, a focus on doing this for the Lord and not for people. So here is the, the focus of this particular text and the verses in between that we'll really look at today. But as we have gone off and on throughout time through the, the book of Colossians, there are a couple of things to note. What does it mean? What does it look like? to have the proper focus then in our relationships. Well, here's the whole first couple of chapters of foundation that he has provided. In chapter 1 and verse 10, the Bible says this, chapter 1 of Colossians and verse 10, so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing the knowledge of God. Well, there's again the bearing of the good fruit, that we, the good works that we talked about in Matthew 5. But notice that there is a prayer and an aim to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord. Now, it's interesting to note that I cannot say that I am worthy of the Lord. And you cannot as well. We just noted that, in fact, during our obs uh, uh, observation of the Lord's Supper uh, and Paul in 1 Corinthians 11 reminds the people that they need to make sure that they observe this worthily, that is, in a worthy manner, not that they are worthy. None of us deserve the grace of God and the sacrifice of His Son, Jesus Christ, in our behalf. And yet, there is an approach so that I recognize, Lord, I am not worthy of your love, your mercy, your grace, but because of that love and mercy and grace and all that you have done, I want to please you. There is a worthy manner in which we approach. And so this is the prayer of Colossians 1 and verse 10, that there would be a desire to walk worthy of this. Now note, this is a consequence, not a cause. This is important and I'll just mention this here. We're not going to dig deeply into this today. But understand what comes first. We ought to desire to walk worthily, whether that's in our service, our ministry, our use of time, around others in our relationships, because of what Christ has done for us. Not in order to gain benefit and blessing from Him. 
Now, there is benefit, there is blessing, there is God's work in our lives, and yet we don't do this to get something from God. We do this, we act this way in our relationships because of what the Lord has done for us. Now, I, I, here's, here's a statement I can give leading in. It fits all of the relationships that we'll just run through this morning. Uh, but Matthew, excuse me, Romans reminds us that God showed his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. It does not say he showed his love for us because he was so impressed with the way we were acting in life. And if we will have that same approach to the relationships that we are involved with, we can live in a way that is seeking to, to be worthy of what the Lord has um, really for us and for our approach and for our days ahead. Uh, what about husband and wife, parents and children, workers and co-workers? Uh, you, you just go on and on through all the relationships. Do I behave in a godly and Christ-like and loving way because they deserve it? You say, well, okay, I usually do, but you know what? They, they've been just acting like a jerk, so I, I, not this time. Well, that's the whole point. How can we demonstrate Christ? This is such an important principle that we understand this is the effect of understanding what the Lord has done in our lives. It is not the cause of trying to bring about that life and that blessing in our lives. Look in Colossians 1 and verse 18. The Bible says here that he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. And notice this statement, that in everything he, that is Jesus Christ, might be preeminent. Might be preeminent. Earlier in this same passage, verses 13, 14, and 15, we see much about Jesus. We see that he has provided deliverance. We see that he's provided redemption. We see that he is the image of the invisible God. Here's the point. Jesus Christ is to be preeminent. What is preeminent? It's the one and only. It's more than just the most important it, think of it as the only rather than the best. So that as I relate to my wife as husband and wife there, I do so because my focus is on Christ. As I relate to my neighbors, to the folks that I run into in the shopping marts, I do so because my focus is on Christ. He's preeminent. He doesn't have a couple of hours on Sunday morning and then the rest is ours. That's not how it works when Jesus is preeminent. Rather, it spills over into every area of our life. And so I'm very thankful for the, the preeminence that we have in Christ. And because of that, we ought to seek to walk worthy of him. Because of that, we also ought to try to maintain a heavenly focus. We've talked about this in more detail in the past, but look at Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on the earth. Think about that. Keeping a heavenly focus, making sure that we're seeking things that are above where Christ is. And so that will have an effect, right, on the relationships that we walk through each day, the individuals that we interact with. Think about this as a formula. Uh, again, I, I enjoy math. I love that. I enjoy uh, various branches of science, some more than others. Uh, at, at one point, I was substitute teaching chemistry for a while, but it happened to be in a part where it was mostly math. But... I love equations. I love the formulas. And so I give you one at this point. And that is, if we have preeminence, if we hold that Jesus Christ is preeminent as he will, then now it's science math, not 
math, math. So now we don't have an equal sign. We have an arrow. Preeminence to Jesus equals or leads to our seeking of walking worthy with the Lord plus keeping our focus on him. Now, I know formulas, we can think, well, it's too simplistic, and it is, it, it is because we are weak and sinners. We're, we're, in, we're needy before God and his working. And yet, if we can keep, our, our, keep this in mind, that Jesus Christ is preeminent, then hopefully it will continue to lead to a desire to walk worthy and a focus on heavenly things as a result in our lives. What effect does that have while we're interacting with others on the store? Somebody cuts us off, you know, are we going to make sure she knows she did wrong? Or are we going to demonstrate the love of God and the help? Uh, What effect does that have with us, whether we're on the job or in traffic? And it's it's always interesting driving around this. uh, Driving patterns are different. People are people, but there are patterns that seem to be different in different parts of the country. And it is interesting. Uh, In fact, recently there was somebody that that, uh, made a point of, and it didn't upset us, we just made observation, but somebody just made a point of, oh, they're going to get around us, now they're going to get over here and get over here. And that was on 3rd Street. So it was between stoplights. And we ended up at the same stoplight at the same location. The thing that, that was strange to us was that it was an out-of-state license. And we thought it surely would be somebody from here or maybe California. But uh, in fact, it's possible for anyone, right? And so how do we respond? Is our focus on keeping Jesus preeminent? So in chapter 3, we're almost to the, the primary text here. But look at verses 12 through 14. Think about the line of reasoning that Paul has used in the book so far. Jesus is preeminent because of everything he's done. Because of that, we ought to walk worthy and we ought to keep our focus on him. Okay, so now, what does that look like in daily life? Well, that's where we have verses 12 to 14. And again, we've looked at this in more detail in the past as well. But let me read this. Put put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, patience, bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving one another, each other. As the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. The love is listed separately. It is it is not one more item in the list. It is a line, it, it is a word that is above. And here the word above is not that it's more important. It's just, it's literally above in location. So if you think of all these other characteristics of life, and then love is covering them all. Because how can we be compassionate if we don't have love? How can we demonstrate kindness or humility or meekness if we're not allowing love to be a part of that? This is the Christian character that is to be displayed in our works. Matthew 5, 16, so that people will see those good works and glorify your Father, which is in heaven. So that's the foundation. I spent the most time on that point because that is a primary. Now that we'll get into our text that deals with some of the examples of relationships, we could dig in and be, we could have a whole message on wives submit to husbands, a whole message on husbands love your wives, a whole message on each of these. You understand that, but that's not the point. The point is here that we be reminded of our heart, our mind, our focus. Because if our lives are lived with Jesus as preeminent, we will seek to walk worthy, not just in our private worship time, but in every interaction that we have in life. And so we get to point two, the scope of the relationships. 
What kind of relationships are we talking about? And we see this here in verses 18 through 22. And let me read those verses, then I'll jump down to chapter 4 and verse 1. Wives, submit to your husbands as it is fitting in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. Children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. Fathers, do not provoke your children, lest they become discouraged. Bondservants, obey in everything those that are earthly masters, not by way of eye service as people pleasers, but with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. Jump down to chapter 4, verse 1. Masters, treat your bond servants justly and fairly, knowing that you also have a master in heaven. Now, first of all, does this list every relationship that you will have and do have? No. It, it does list many primary relationships that many or most of us uh, have in our lives. Now, it doesn't list even all of the primary. For instance, it mentions fathers, but not mothers. It, mention, it does mention both husbands and wives, uh, but it's interesting to me, fathers, but not mothers. And so you have some of these. And in fact, as uh, my wife enjoys being here with the grandkids, it doesn't mention Grammys either. But you know, there are always relationships, whether it's running into somebody at the store and chatting about something that's going on or whatever it is. This gives us just some examples of how the rest of the book of Colossians works. Jesus is preeminent. Here's what it looks like when we seek to walk worthy of him and keep our focus on him. It spills out into these uh, attitudes of our lives. How do those attitudes then work in this instance? Now, let me mention something quickly as we, as we go through. Uh, the, the commentators, as they work through this passage, they would have, and I won't even share it with you, but they will have a particular technical term for this particular list of requirements. And the meaning of what they believe is that this is just almost like, like a short list that is used as code for the entire relationship. They, the, the commentators will point not only to Colossians, but to Ephesians, to Peter, to a few other places in Scripture where you'll find similar, but they're not always identical, lists. And then they also identify some other similar but identical lists like this used in the first two or three hundred years of the early church by some of the early leaders that wrote and left for us what they had written. Not inspired of God at that time, but still there. I have, I have another thought for you. I, I will not say that I'm wiser than them. I don't even disagree with what they're saying. That It's fine that this is a kind of a codified list that is used in substance for the whole. But here's what is interesting to me as we look through life. And this will guide us as we walk through these few verses quickly together. And that is that as Paul to the Colossians is reminding people in these relationships that they need to honor God, they need to glorify God, they need to keep him preeminent. He doesn't list all 27 things that a wife or a husband or a father needs to do. Rather, it seems to me, key word seems to me, this is not inspired of God. I've not had a vision but it seems to me that these are areas that if we would look at our own lives, we recognize sometimes these are some of the easy areas in which we can be tripped up. Now, there might be many areas, but these are maybe some of the areas where we can be tripped up. And so let's, let's just run through this quickly. I, again, not to dig deeply into any of them, but to understand the concept of keeping Christ preeminent so that we will respond in relationships appropriately. Well, first, chapter 3, verse 18, wives, submit to your husbands as it is fitting in the Lord. Uh, submit to your husbands as it is fitting to the Lord. Uh, remember that 
the book of Acts reminds us that there are times when there is direction and order that is provided to mankind that must be disobeyed because it is better to obey God than to obey man. We understand that. We're not talking about a blind robotic wife, but there is a natural tendency toward in society and especially by society's teaching uh, that the wives don't really need the husbands. They can just do what they want. doesn't matter what they say or what leadership he provides. Wives often may face a, the temptation to ignore or oppose or maybe even not even seek leadership from her husband. Society tells wives that that's the way to do it. And in fact, and probably a great danger here because to say otherwise publicly is not politically correct and does lead to often an amount of scorn that can be shared. Now, is this all that there is for a wife? Obviously not. Uh, and by the way, earlier in Colossians, and we say this here and also with the servants and the masters, there is an understanding that in Christ we are all on an even plane. This has nothing to do with superiority. It has more to do with order. Uh, and that kind of thing. But throughout the Bible, in Genesis, we learn that the wife is a help that is meet for her husband. Timothy reminds the wives that they should help to manage the household. Titus, that she should love her husband and love her children. First Peter uh, talks about the beauty of her character. Ephesians, respecting her husband. Proverbs 31, providing for her family. Proverbs 18, 22, that she can be trusted by her husband. These are great things, but again, it may be commonly, easily a point of being tripped up in just saying, well, I, yeah, I don't care what the husband says, I'll just do my own thing. And so there is verse 18, verse 19, husbands, verse 19, husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. Now, it's interesting, he doesn't stop after love your wives. In Ephesians, he reminds us, love your wives even as Christ loved the church. Uh, that's a sacrificial, all-in love for that wife. And that is a wonderful thing as part of that relationship. But here, I believe, there is a commonness to husbands being guilty of being harsh with their wives. Uh, it usually not right away, usually develops after a time. How can that harshness be demonstrated? Well, we live, in a, we live in a tough world. And so we understand that, yes, it can even be, even to the extent of physical abuse and all of that. We understand that. Uh, but many times, even without that, there can be a harshness. I, I can remember in my, my early years, uh, still married one, two, three years, something like that. I was working on a construction site. And other guys would show up, and I was always bothered by the fact that, that at times they would get together and they'd swap horror stories about their wives and always be talking them down about how bad they are and how, oh, they, she did this and she's dumb and whatever, rather than than dignifying their wife and showing demonst a demonstration of kindness. And so there is a way, whether it's in how the time is made available for the wife, whether it's the resources that are provided appropriately or withheld, it can be in words many times, a shortness. And so the husbands are reminded. Now, I, I mentioned this for the wives, so I mentioned this for the husbands. It's got to be fair, right? Is that all there is in the Bible for the husband? Well, no, of course not. There are other things. First Peter talks about being considerate. Ephesians 5, we already talked about loving his wife as Christ loved the church. First, First Timothy, providing for his wife and for his household. Ecclesiastes says that the wife should enjoy the wife, uh, the, uh, the, enjoy his life with the wife of his youth. In 1 Corinthians 7, it even talks about the natural tendency and a good tendency to want to please his wife. In Proverbs 31, 28, he praises his wife. And yet, it brings us back to the tendency of harshness. We want to make sure, certainly as wives, that we don't allow 
that this warning in verse 18 to keep us from glorifying God before others, we want to make sure as husbands that we do not demonstrate a harshness toward our wives and, and prevent that glory from going to God. So what about children? Now, don't everyone turn around and look at the three young ones. Because you know what? We're all children, right? We've all walked through these days in our lives. And we notice that verse 20 says, Children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. There is an obedience that is necessary. And so when there is an ability for a child to obey their parents, and particularly when that obedience is seen by others, there is an understanding that God may receive glory. Now, think of the other things that are in this scripture that a child may be responsible for. Proverbs 1.8, he's to hear the instruction. Proverbs 31.28, he's to praise his mother. So, grandkids, Corbin Bennett and Rosalind, I'm going to ask you later, did you go home and praise your mom? I'll be checking on you, okay? So Hebrews 12, that, they, that children ought to accept discipline. And 3 John, that children ought to walk in truth. Proverbs 15, they ought to learn from their correction. Proverbs 20, they demonstrate their godliness, how? In their actions. So that brings us to the other side of that connection. Interestingly enough, some would say, well, this includes mothers too. But fathers are noted, perhaps because as fathers, we're more guilty of this more frequently. I don't know. But fathers, do not provoke your children lest they become discouraged. I, I smiled a little inside during our discipleship time when Laramie had mentioned a, some particular instance and said, no, no, you can't respond this way. That'd be provoking a child in that way. So there you go. You passed that one. Good job. So is it not true? You, we all have fathers, right? Now, not everyone grew up with a father, but we all had fathers. And there are some times that a father can provoke a child. He just has a way a certain look, a certain response, a certain set of words, a certain tone, uh, or picking on certain things and ignoring other things. It is possible to provoke. Now, fathers have other responsibilities. We understand that. Proverbs 22, to train your children. Deuteronomy 6, to teach the Bible to your children. And Proverbs 13, to discipline in love. In 1 Thessalonians, to encourage and comfort. In 3 John, to demonstrate joy when you see your children walking in truth. And yet, it is sometimes possible for us to ruin an opportunity to bring glory to God because we respond harshly and we cause children to become discouraged. Then we get to servants in verse 22, where the Bible says, whatever you do, work heartily. At, well, that's verse 23. Uh, we, bond servants obey in everything those who are your earthly masters, not by way of eye service as people pleasers, but with sincerity of heart. In this passage, we're reading that they ought not to do it with eye service. Uh, we understand that every workplace is different. But every workplace I've ever been, whether it's a secular company or a Christian company, there is still humanity involved. And there is still sometimes that little uptick of interest and excitement and energy and, and application when the supervisor walks in the door. Do we do it with eye service or do we serve appropriately? Do we do it with sincerity of heart or are we putting on a front? Now, I, I'm not saying you need to be best friends, best buddies with your boss. That's not the point. The point is that we're not artificially creating some kind of image that isn't real. We rather ought to be serving in a way that is honest and accurate. And then fearing the Lord. This is interesting in this passage because the, the employee who is working only for himself is missing out. We ought to be working for the Lord. 
I've worked in many jobs in my life. At one point, I started writing them down. I was just curious. I, you know, I've helped to build barns or remodel inside of homes. I've helped to dig graves. I've helped to lay drainage tile. I've sold insurance, uh, run database reports. I've taught elementary school. I've, that list goes on and on and on. And I will tell you that every one of those jobs has its perks and it has its problems. Every one. There's no such thing as a perfect job. But every job can be done to the glory of God. And if it can't, maybe find another job. But every job ought to be able to be done to the glory of God. And then there are masters, chapter 4, verse 1. Masters, treat your bond servants justly and fairly, knowing that you also have a master in heaven. Now listen, I, I'm a detailed person. I like everything to be in its place and to be organized and to be completely laid out exactly right. I cannot tell you how much struggle I gave to chapter 4, verse 1, where it says justly and fairly. So, yeah, they have to be distinct. They have to be two different words. They are two different words in the Greek. But if you look up the first word, and for definitions, one of the possible definitions is fairly. And if you look up fairly, one of the possible definitions is justly. Now, I, I guess the closest I could come is just to say that when they, when they are to perform justly, that there is maybe more of a focus on the management who is performing that action. Make sure you're just in what you're doing. And fairly has a little bit more of an, a, a focus on the people who receive the action of your deeds. However, I'll easily withdraw that because... That might be the case, but when it comes right down to it, they're so very similar. My understanding is that Paul used both words because he just wanted to make it a point. It was important. Let me repeat this. And I want you to see in that way that this, this is the case. Now, I understand, I understand that in many circles... The boss is always the bad guy, right? I remember at one of the offices that I worked at, that was even the joke, you know? And it was a joke told openly and in front of the boss. And he laughed jovially about it. And I just understood that there were some people that took it a little more seriously than others. But the boss is always the bad guy. Well, okay, how do we respond to that? There's some point to this. It's coming back. Is the boss always a bad guy? Okay, well, wait a minute. Romans 3.10, there is none good, no, not one. Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So yes, the, the, the boss, the management is always a sinner. And so are all the employees. And so is every wife. And so is every husband. And so is every child. And so is every parent. What about your neighbors? Are they perfect, angelic? No, they also are sinners in need of a godly response. And so that brings us back full circle. Wives, husbands, children, fathers, employees, management. Neighbors, well, you say, I, I don't have any neighbor. I, Go back and read about the Good Samaritan. Who then is my neighbor? And so those that wanted the answer walked away sorrowful. They did not like Jesus' answer. Any individual that we are interacting with is our neighbor. And it needs to be an interaction that is based on a preeminence of Jesus Christ and a love for God. We close with verses 24 and 25. I only need a couple sentences for these because here are the promises of the relationship. Look at verse 24. Knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance of your reward. You are serving the Lord Jesus Christ. Wives, husbands, children, parents, etc. You're serving the Lord Jesus Christ. But notice he said you're going to receive a reward. So this is a good thing, a positive thing. 
And then in verse 25, he says, for the wrongdoer will be paid back for the wrong he has done, and there, there is no partiality. And so here we have the negative side of things. There will be some negative reaction, negative results as warranted. Now, so the, the easy, I guess, uh, translation in the modern language for verses 24 and 25 is if you make Jesus preeminent, try to walk worthy and bring glory to him in each of these relationships, you will be rewarded. It may be only in eternity, but often it is in this life also. Verse 25, if you choose not to, and you live in relationships which do not please the Lord, you're going to know about it. And usually it's sooner rather than later. Arguments, breakups, other results that come our way. And so, again, back to that formula, chemical formula, preeminence of Christ leads to walking worthy and, and uh, pointing to the things eternal, the things heavenly. And that ought to be true in your relationships every day, this week and in the days to come. Let your light so shine before men in the way you interact with them so that they would see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Let's bow in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we do thank you for this passage, Lord, we confess that we have, we've, we've often uh, strayed from responding correctly in our relationships. But I pray that you would help us to keep our eyes on you, that when we see our family members, our coworkers, our neighbors, uh, those that we just run into, that we would see them through the eyes of Christ that we might bring glory to God even in this way. We ask in Jesus' name, amen.